Okay, so uh, once again, good morning everyone. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I'm not going to move on to uh, the next sutta, which is really about how to deal with the mind, how to deal with thinking and, and these kind of things. Uh, and so, so far we have been looking largely at the idea of right view, how to, especially towards the end, how to use that right view to give rise to joy and uh, happiness in the meditation. Uh, and uh, so now a little bit more about how to deal with thinking, uh, and then towards the end we will come back to the more uh, refined aspects of meditation again. So this is the uh, kind of the idea, that's the plan, subject to change, of course, uh, as all plans uh, must be. Uh, so we'll see what uh, comes out of this. So this next sutta is known as the uh, Dveda Vitaka Sutta in Pali, the two kinds of thought. And uh, this is another of these uh, autobiographical suttas of the Buddha, how he dealt with his own thinking mind, and how he kind of overcame especially the uh, defiled thoughts, the thoughts that have a negative effect on the path, uh, and uh, kind of moving it towards the positive thinking. Uh. And again, it is very interesting uh, for this reason, because again we see the uh, Buddha to be dealing with issues that are just all too obvious for most of us, uh, uh, you know, problems of uh, ill will and uh, harshness perhaps, uh, and also the sensory realm, yeah, how to kind of move away from these things uh, and move towards more wholesome qualities. Uh. So again, the Buddha provides an example for us, uh, the Buddha to be uh, uh, The kind of the humanity of the Buddha sort of shines through in all of these passages. Uh. So let's see what this uh, sutta has to say. This is also in the middle length sayings of the Buddha. This is sutta number 19, and discourse number 19, two kinds of thought. Uh, and uh, it says extract here. Is it, uh, it is indeed an extract. It actually goes even longer towards the end. Uh, that's true. Uh, or maybe not. Uh, I think there is a, uh, yeah, there is a contraction there in the middle. That's why it's called extract. Okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to go a little bit faster than I have so far, because uh, uh, we are not that many sessions left, uh, so we kind of have to get going a little bit, uh, so, but I'll no, pro, try not to go too fast, uh, so that we can still enjoy the content properly. So this is uh, what happens. So, uh, so I have heard, at one time the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jaita's Grove, uh, and at Apindika's monastery here. There the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Mendicants, venerable sir, they replied, and the Buddha said this. So here we have the kind of standard opening of the suttas, that I'm not sure we saw that before. So I have heard, and this indicates an oral transmission. Yeah, I've heard this, and so it's orally transmitted. This is kind of the idea with that phrase, that opening phrase. And then the Buddha says this, Mendicants, before my awakening, when I, still, when I was still unawakened but intent on awakening, I thought, why don't I meditate, or why don't I live or dwell by dividing my thoughts into two classes? So I assign essential, malicious and cruel thoughts to one class. And I assign thoughts of renunciation, goodwill, and harmlessness uh, to a second class. Uh, right? So here the idea is that there are uh, unwholesome or problematic thoughts, uh, and then there are thoughts that are not problematic. Uh, so you divide them in this way between two different, uh, in two different groups. Uh, and um, the um, problematic thoughts here, sensual thoughts, these are really... I think sensual is not an ideal translation. This really means thoughts about the sen sensory world, the five sense world. And that's why this is a very, very broad class of thoughts. Yeah? Almost anything we think is about that five sense world. It's only when you're kind of uh, dreaming about meditation and, uh, you know, and uh, reflecting on the, the spiritual aspects that you're not engulfed in the sensual world. So, so much of our thinking is engulfed with that. Uh, so, it's a very broad category. Sensual thought seems to be much more narrow, uh, and, uh, but actually it's very broad. Uh, then we have the idea of malicious thoughts. Uh, so, these are thoughts that uh, are about ill will thoughts, yeah, angry thoughts, irritated thoughts. Uh, it's this broad spectrum from the slightest irritation to the kind of greatest rage. 
<laughs> Everything is really included in that. Uh, and then we have the last one, which is the uh, Vihingsa Vitaka, which is here translated as cruel. Uh, but vi the word Vihingsa really means any kind of uh, harmfulness. Uh, yeah, when you don't consider uh, other beings, it's like almost like being inconsiderate. Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, you'd haven't really, uh, you know, if you're walking down a path uh, and there's all these little creatures on the path, like ants or whatever, uh, and you just walk down there and you don't really care whether you trample them underfoot or not. Uh, that would be considered inconsiderate, inconsiderate or callous or hard-hearted or however you want to put it. Uh, and it's the opposite of being compassionate. Uh, yeah, compassion is the opposite. Uh, if you see that your actions have a detrimental effect, then you uh, try to correct it, you try to do things in a different way. Uh, so, um, uh, the uh, the word here for what is going on is more like being ruthless or hard-hearted or something like that. Uh, cruel, cruel is part of it, but I think it's much broader than being cruel. Uh, and you can see it is the opposite. It's not the same as ill will. Yeah, you you can be hard-hearted without having ill will. Uh, so the opposite of ill will uh, is metta, loving kindness. So the opposite of avihingsa is compassion. Uh, the opposite of hard-heartedness is compassion. Uh, so slightly two different uh, areas of, uh, uh, of of thinking, and it, it's kind of interesting this last one here because it is a bit different from how we normally think about intention. We talk about bad intentions, uh, but here it is more like just the lacking of good intention, which is a problem. Uh, hard heartedness in itself is not really an intention; it's more like a lack of something here, yeah? and that lack, that destruction of living beings or the bad conduct through a lack of something. That itself is a problem here. Uh, so if you don't care about the consequences of your actions, uh, actually you have, a, you have a problem. You're supposed to care. Uh, you're supposed to take this into account. Uh, if you are like a callous business person and you leave a trail of destruction in your, your wake, yeah, yeah, that's kind of bad, right? Uh, that's how we end up getting climate change and we get all, all of these kind of things because we don't take into consideration the greater issues that, that are happening here. So these are negative, the, the problematic side of thinking here. And then you have the opposite, the thought of renunciation. And renunciation here literally means the lessening or the, or the reduction in the interest in the five sense world. Nekama is the Pali word. Nekama is actually in opposition to karma. Karma is sensuality. Karma is different from kamma. Kamma is action. Karma is uh, uh, essentiality or sensor, the sensory world. Uh, karma versus kamma. Slight, slightly different pronunciation there. Yeah. And then you have goodwill, and then you have harmlessness, which is basically compassion in the second class. Uh. So this is how you divide your thinking. And now comes a kind of slightly interesting phrase uh, right after that. Then as I dwelt... Yeah, in this, the Pali is missing a word here, which makes loses a little bit of the impact. Uh, as I dwelt thus, uh, diligent, keen, and resolute. Uh, yeah, the thus there is kind of interesting because the thus means uh, that he's referring back to the idea of dividing his thoughts into two classes. Uh, as I as I was living thus, and I think meditated here is also not an ideal word here. It's more like as I was living in this way, uh, uh, diligent. In other words, heedful. Right keen, interested, inspired, and resolute, here diligent maybe. So uh, the idea that the very fact of dividing uh, your thinking into two classes, that is what it means to be diligent and heedful uh, and keen. And that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because it kind of shifts the whole idea of what the path is about. Uh, often diligent uh, and resolute refers to kind of making an effort. Uh, and often when we think about effort, we think about doing things. Uh, but here, obviously, it is about more about being circumspect and careful and wise, right? This is about wisdom when you divide your thinking mind into this way. Uh, and this is one of the things that we will see throughout this particular sutta here, and you see also in other suttas, that making an effort, being diligent, often actually refers to wisdom. Uh, it is not referred to willpower or forcing your way or kind of making a, an effort through the sheer force of the will. Uh, but actually it is a very subtle kind of effort uh, where you apply the wisdom to the path uh, and 
And that is actually the powerful way of making effort in Buddhism. Using wisdom, reflecting in the right way. It's a very different kind of effort from how we normally think about it. And so, this is what comes out in the suttas. And uh, uh, my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, he always had this uh, nice uh, distinction between wisdom power and willpower. Uh, and one of the things that we shall see in the sutta is the idea that actually <laughs> wisdom power uh, is far more powerful than willpower in affecting the path, in making the path uh, uh, progress. So, yeah, so as I was dwelling in this way, dividing my thoughts in this way, uh, then he says, a sensual thought, or a thought relating to the sensory world, arose. I understood uh, this sensory thought has arisen in me. It leads to hurting myself, uh, hurting others, uh, and hurting both. It blocks wisdom, uh, it's on the side of anguish, uh, and it doesn't lead to extinguishment. When I reflected, uh, that it leads to hurting myself, uh, it went away. When I reflected that it leads to hurting others, uh, it went away. When I reflected that it leads to hurting both, uh, it went away. When I reflect that it blocks wisdom, uh, as that it's on the side of anguish, uh, and it doesn't lead to extinguishment, uh, it went away. So I gave up, uh, got rid of, and eliminated any sensory thoughts uh, that arose. Uh, yeah, and this is, uh, again, a very interesting passage to my mind uh, because uh, it kind of brings out the idea how to overcome problems in a very clear way. Uh. So the first thing, when the sensual, sensory thought arises, uh, the first thing is that he understands that uh, this sensual thought has arisen in me. Uh. Yeah, this is the beginning of this. Uh. And, uh, uh, of course, that may... Maybe that seems obvious, yeah? you know, sometimes it is very obvious. Sometimes the thoughts of the world are very powerful, we know exactly what's going on. Uh, sometimes uh, the ill will is very clear, you know you're having some problem with anger or whatever. Uh, but actually the point, of course, here is that all your thoughts are completely classified in this way. Uh, and sometimes these thoughts can be very subtle, uh, very refined things. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example of this. For example, you may be meditating, uh, and you stop somehow, you stop making progress, uh, but you feel peaceful, uh, everything feels nice, you cannot really see any defilements in your mind, uh, and yet uh, there will be some very subtle attachments there that stop you from going further. Uh, and those subtle attachments will be maybe a very slight holding on to the senses, a slight holding on to the body. Uh, you're not able or willing to let go yet, because you haven't really understood the benefits of letting go. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is so subtle, you can't even see it in your mind. Uh, this is how subtle these things are. Uh, and so sometimes you have to go uh, by confidence in the suttas. Uh, the problem probably is that I have some kind of attachment to the five senses and the body. So you reflect a little bit more of them, on them uh, in the ways that I have been suggesting throughout this retreat. Uh, and as you do that, you grasp lessons a little bit. Uh, and when you grasp lessons a little bit, uh, come back to your breath, uh, you go deeper next time, uh, and you start to see how this works. And then, in retrospect, you see very clearly that you had attachments there. Because when you go further, you're looking back, uh, you're on the frog coming out of the water, uh, and you see what's going on. Uh. So, uh, it's actually quite profound when he says this. I understood a sensual thought had arisen, because it really means, it implies the whole range of, sen of sensory thoughts. Uh, yeah? to the most refined aspects of them. And um, so first of all, you see that it has arisen. Obviously you need that, otherwise you can't do anything with it. And then comes the reflection that you do. And this is kind of what is so powerful here. You understand that it leads to hurting myself, hurting others and hurting both. Yeah, Or it leads to affliction for myself and others. And there's different translations here. And, uh, and this is kind of the, uh, this is the sort of reflection that is required uh, when you understand the downside of these things, uh, how in the long run it leads to, as I said before, there is no sensory realm without conflict, uh, there is no sensory realm without violence, uh, there is no sensory realm without all of these problems that we're seeing in the world. Uh, 
you know, war in Ukraine. Actually, it is to be expected in this world. Uh, climate change probably is to be expected. Nothing has really gone wrong. Uh, it's just the nature of humanity. Maybe we can't deal with these things. Maybe it's just too difficult. Uh, maybe just, uh, you know. And uh, then uh, you understand, because of these problems that we cause for each other in this realm, uh, hurting myself, uh, hurting others, uh, hurting both, uh, you lose some of the interest in that realm uh, because you see how problematic it is. Uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, so this is the first thing, understanding this. And of course it is hard to understand this. Uh, and uh, some of you may object to me making so much out of this because uh, it uh, sounds too difficult to do and it sounds too hard and we are enjoying this realm to some extent. Uh, so, but, but don't take this too far. Don't take it to the point where you stop enjoying the world. Uh, take it as a thought experiment. Uh, Take it as something to reflect on, something to ponder a little bit uh, and see what it does to your mind. Uh, and if you do it in the right way, you will find that actually it is helpful on the spiritual path. Yeah? It takes you in the right direction. But go gently with yourself. Uh, these things are not meant for harshness towards ourselves or to kind of reject the world kind of outright like that. Uh, that is not the point. Uh, these are more like reflections, contemplations to consider and see what, it, what effect it has on your mind. Uh, so it's more like a natural progress uh, rather than a forced kind of progress, uh, which is, can be very destructive and very, uh, yeah, very bad for ourselves, basically. Yeah. Uh, but when it works, uh, this is the effect the Buddha promises uh, that it will have. Uh, then uh, he says, uh, it blocks wisdom, right? Uh, too much uh, sensual thought blocks wisdom. Why? Well, because you have an uh, interest in something that is... Uh, uh, lower and it stops the mind from giving up those distortions of the mind that block you from seeing things clearly. It's again this idea of having a vested interest in something. Yeah? And that vested interest means that it's impossible to see things with clarity. You will see it with a desire, with attachment. Uh, that is the nature of a vested interest. Uh, and so you, uh, it blocks wisdom. Uh, so if you want to be wiser, is there anyone here who doesn't want to be wiser? Usually everyone wants to be wise, right? Because wisdom is such a beautiful quality. Who would not be to be wise? You would have to be unwise not to be wise. <laughs> not, to, not to want to be wise, I should say. So, um, yes, yeah, so it blocks, but that's kind of terrible that it blocks wisdom. Huh? That is already kind of enough reason to want to get out of it. And then I can, you know, it's very obvious if you reflect on it that when the sensual or the desires for the world are very strong, yeah, you can see that your mind is distorted. Yeah. And then sometimes when you come out of that desire later on, you can feel the clarity that emerges from the removing of the desire in the mind. It's actually quite obvious when you, when you look at it carefully. Yeah. And so the more you remove the mind out of that desire and attachment to the sensory world, uh, the more clarity you will have uh, and the more ability you will have to see things uh, with proper insight. Uh. And so the, uh, that it blocks wisdom is not that hard to see. Uh. Just reflect on that uh, and watch your mind carefully and you start to see these things. Uh. Ill will is even worse. You know, we'll come to ill will in a second. That's kind of far worse again. Uh, but uh, sensory desire is already problematic. It's on the side of anguish. Yeah? When you have sensual desires, you are not in the present. You are in the future. You are separated from where you want to be. Yeah? That craving itself is a state of suffering. Yeah? Craving not only leads to suffering, is it a state of suffering in its own right, when you see it rightly. Yeah? Uh, and it doesn't lead to extinguishment. It doesn't lead to Nibbana. It doesn't lead to the ending of defilements. It doesn't lead to the ending of suffering. Yeah? It doesn't lead to all those things that actually are really interesting in the world, profoundly interesting. Yeah. And then, of course, the Buddha says, when I reflected that it leads to hurting myself, uh, it went away. Yeah. So uh, if it doesn't go away when you reflect like this, it means you haven't fully understood uh, the degree to which it hurts you. Uh. And this is the problem for the vast majority of human beings. We don't understand these things properly. Uh. This hurts you. It hurts others, right? And not only does it hurt you and others, it hurts both at the same time. Uh, and we become uh, self-centered when we are, uh, when we indulge in the five sense world. Uh, it is a kind of self-centered uh, way of thinking about things. Uh, or maybe we become sac sacrificing ourselves for others, which also is not such a good idea. So uh, it leads to problems. Uh, 
And if this kind of thinking does not work for you, uh, it means you haven't reflected on this deeply enough. Uh, you need to come back to it, try to see it in a deeper way. Uh, deepen your meditation. Every time your meditation deepens, uh, there's a chance for seeing these things more clearly. Uh, when I reflected, it blocks wisdom, is on the side of anguish, it doesn't lead to extinguishment, uh, again, it went away. Uh, and then comes this last phrase here, uh, so I gave it up, uh, got rid of it, uh, and eliminated any sensual thoughts that arose. Uh, and uh, these Pali words here that I used here for uh, gave up, got rid of, eliminated, uh, they are quite strong words. Uh, there are words that sound a little bit like you are getting the sledgehammer out and crushing these to smithereens. Uh, that's what it sounds like. Uh, and uh, so then the interesting question is, how do we use that sledgehammer? Uh, if we're going to use it, I mean, what is the right way of using a sledgehammer? Is it a kind of, a, what sort of sledgehammer are we talking about here? <laughs> and uh, the, um, the interesting answer is, right, we have just seen through this process here that actually the sledgehammer is wisdom. Uh, usually when we think about sledgehammer, we think about an enormous amount of willpower. Uh, I don't know if you have ever used a sledgehammer. Uh, I have sometimes. Uh, they are really heavy. If you don't use willpower, you're not going to get anywhere. You have to use lots of willpower and a lot of muscle power if you have any as well. Uh, and then kind of this, you can use a sledgehammer. Uh, uh, but so what we are seeing here is that those muscle uh, and that will is not the normal kind of willpower that we use. It is actually wisdom. Uh, and so if you really want to overcome these defilements, uh, the real sledgehammer is actually wisdom. The thing that actually is able to eliminate these things properly is not willpower, but wisdom power. So it's not really a sledgehammer at all, right? Because wisdom doesn't really feel like a sledgehammer. It is too refined to be that. But the power of wisdom in overcoming defilement is far greater than willpower. If you use willpower to overcome your defilements, very often what you do is like you suppress them a little bit, yeah? You hold them down, uh, but soon enough uh, you let go of the holding down and they come back again uh, because you're only holding them down. Suppression means like a, you know, when you have boil, you have a kettle with boiling water and you try to hold the lid down, uh, right? Uh, and of course it doesn't take long before the thing just explodes out again. Uh, and the mind of the farmers, if you try to hold it down, the farmers are kind of bubbling underneath, like boiling water, waiting to kind of explode out again. And as soon as you relax a little bit, they come back at you with extra energy. And you're kind of bowled over by these defilements sometimes. You cannot stand, uh, you cannot really deal with them properly. And this is the problem with willpower. Sometimes willpower does work. Occasionally it eliminates the defilements, but often it just holds them down, waiting for them to come back. Yeah. But wisdom power, when it is used in the right way, yeah, because it is used as an opposing of the defilement, it, it is used in a way that you see the defilement as problematic, yeah, you actually eliminate the entire defilement. Yeah. It just evaporates, yeah, because you're seeing the opposite side, yeah, and seeing that opposite side uh, allows you to, or not doesn't allow you, it just causes the defilement to evaporate. Uh. So wisdom power is far more powerful. Uh. Number two, it takes less energy. Yeah, using willpower all the time takes a lot of energy, tires you out. Uh. Wisdom power takes a slight movement of the mind. Uh. The only downside with wisdom power, it takes contemplation, it takes reflection, it takes aligning the way you see the world with the way the Buddha sees the world. And that is actually quite time-consuming. Uh, you need to change the perceptions of things gradually, gradually, gradually. The habit of the mind is so powerful. The momentum from the past drives you forward uh, with an incredible force. Uh, and you're like a super tanker on the ocean. I don't know if you've seen these super tankers. They are enormous. Uh, and some of them, they weigh like half a million tons. Uh, got half a million tons of oil in them or something like that. Uh, and they, uh, when they go full speed, and they actually go surprisingly fast to be such enormous vessels, uh, it takes like tens of kilometers to turn them around because the momentum is so great. Uh, and we are like super tankers. Uh, our mind are, are conditioned by a very powerful momentum from the past. We have always indulged in these things, always uh, uh, been trapped by these defilements. Uh, and now we're heading in that direction at super speed. Uh, so gradually, 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 
we change our perceptions. Uh, gradually you learn to think more like the Buddha. And the super tanker is gradually changing direction. Gradually, gradually. And this is what we're seeing in this sutta. We see it more clearly further down. Uh, and eventually one day you find yourself facing the opposite way. Uh, and instead of having thoughts of sensual pleasures uh, or thoughts of the sensory world that um, are the habit of the mind, the habit of the mind suddenly becomes uh, the giving up of these things, uh, not really being interested in these things, uh, still enjoying them when they're there, but not having an interest that drives craving or attachment. Uh. So the power of wisdom is really what this is about, uh, and very interesting, I reckon. Uh, so now we come to the other kinds of uh, uh, bad thoughts. Uh, then as I dwelt or stayed or lived in this way, uh, uh, heedful, keen and diligent, uh, a thought of ill will arose on me. Uh, a thought of uh, um, ruthlessness uh, arose. I understood that this thought of ill will or this thought of ruthlessness has arisen in me. Uh, it leads to hurting myself, hurting others and hurting both. Uh, it blocks wisdom, it's on the side of anguish, it does not lead to, or it leads away, I think, from extinguishment. Uh, when I reflected that it hurts myself, that it hurts others, that it hurts both, uh, it went away. Uh, when I reflected that it blocks wisdom, is on the side of anguish, uh, and doesn't lead, and leads away from Nibbana, extinguishment, uh, it went away. Uh, so I gave it up, uh, got rid of it, and eliminated any thought of ill will, and any thought of ruthlessness that arose. So here we are coming to, I think, maybe even more important things. Yeah, I think the most important thing often is, is actually to deal with ill will, uh, because uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is far more detrimental than the, the thoughts of the sensory world. This is where the real problems are in life. Yeah? Ill will causes so much anguish, uh, it causes so much interpersonal problems, uh, it causes so much, it probably causes wars, right? And then wars are caused by ill will and anger and all of these kind of things. Uh. So it is really a, a scourge on our society and our private lives, uh, this uh, ill will. Uh. And so this, um, the Buddha also says that ill will is the most detrimental of these things. Uh. And, and this is kind of the good news, uh, it is the easiest thing to overcome, uh, right? Uh, Thoughts of the sensory world are actually very hard to overcome because it seems delightful, it seems pleasant, it doesn't seem to be such a big issue. But ill will, you can actually quite easily understand why that is a problem. So what I would really recommend you to do to focus your effort in this area. I have talked maybe too much about sensory pleasures on this retreat, I don't know, it depends on where you are at and what your practice is like. But uh, this is really the area that matters the most, uh, yeah? understanding the danger of this. And it's actually quite easy to understand. Uh. So uh, here I have spoken a bit already about how to overcome ill will, uh, how to reflect on this. Uh, yeah? uh, the idea that other people don't really know what they're doing, uh, that they are kind of walking. Ill will very often is about other people, that's just the reality of things. Uh. So you need to see other people in a new way. See them as conditioned beings. Uh, see them as uh, hurt individuals. Everyone, we're all kind of hurt to some extent. Yeah? The world can be quite rough with us. Uh, and this understanding they're hurt, uh, understanding their conditioning, uh, understanding that they don't, don't really have any idea what they're doing in this world. Uh, they think they are creating happiness for themselves and others, when actually they're doing the exact opposite. Uh, this is called blindness. Uh, and once you start to understand that, the ill will actually turns into compassion instead. Uh, you start to see people in a new way. Uh, you stop focusing so much on the faults in other people. Uh, one of the terrible things in our society is the, the, the tendency to always look at people's faults. Uh, yeah, if you read a newspaper, it is all kind of criticizing their left, right and center. Uh, and, uh, but actually, there's a lot of goodness in the world. Uh, and sometimes all we have to do is change our attention a little bit and look for the good things in other people. Uh, everyone here is flawed to some extent. I'm sure no one here will claim to be perfect. Uh, does anyone here claim to be perfect? Uh, <laughs> okay, good, I was right. Okay, so that's good, right? Uh, except for maybe the Buddha over here. The Buddha might claim to be perfect in a certain way, right? But even the Buddha is probably not perfect in all ways. Uh, but in certainly in some very important ways, the Buddha is perfect. That's why we call him perfected in the suttas. So, um, 
uh, because uh, because of that, uh, yeah, uh, we're not perfect, and yet uh, we have many beautiful inclinations, uh, many beautiful things going on in our lives. Uh, we're all coming on retreats. No one in their right mind, if they were an evil person, would come on a retreat like this. Keep the eight precepts, renounce having food in the afternoon. You're crazy. I have to have my meal in the afternoon, uh, whatever else it might be. Uh, yeah, and so. Uh, and so this is what we need to do, shift our attention to the good things in people around us. Uh, there is a lot of goodness in the world. Uh, I was very impressed when I was in Poland recently, because Poland, obviously, they have a common border with Ukraine. Uh, so a lot of the refugees coming out of Ukraine, they come to Poland. Uh, and the Poles are just so hospitable, right? The Ukraine, I mean, okay, they maybe they see the Ukrainians a bit like their brothers from the East. Uh, uh, and then they take them in and they leave them in the houses and they kind of give them a room and shelter, you know. And uh, especially, I mean, we have done that in many, many countries, but in Poland more so than anywhere else because of the large number of refugees. Uh, it is so beautiful that people open up their houses in this way, open up their hearts to people who obviously are suffering incredible injustice. Uh, and uh, what a wonderful thing that is. Uh, and sometimes it takes a crisis for us to kind of come to the table and actually do the right thing. Yeah. We suddenly our compassion comes out, right? We see the problem in the world. Yeah. Our compassion arises, we start to do the right thing. Yeah. But then when things are going well, we become complacent. Everything is going well, I have my money, society is going back. Yeah, these bad politicians are doing bad things. We start complaining about all the petty little things that actually we should just overlook it and we shouldn't worry about. Yeah. But only during the crisis do we kind of overlook those things and we kind of instead we uh, uh, look to the good qualities in the people around us. Uh, there's so much goodness to be seen. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with just the habits of the mind, the habits of fault-finding and seeing the negative uh, when actually uh, we should look in a different direction. Uh, and so all of this then leads to a, uh, a kind of re-moving away from ill-will and harshness in our life. Uh, and becoming more gentle, uh, more soft-hearted, uh, more appreciative, more forgiving of others. Uh, yeah, this idea of forgiveness is such an important thing here. Yeah? Yeah, letting go of all the, the hurt and these things. Okay, I forgive you. I realize you don't know what you're doing. I also don't really know what I'm doing, so we're in the same boat. Uh, it doesn't make you feel superior just because you're saying someone else doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, because you realize you also have the same issue to some extent, uh, if not as much to some extent. Uh, Next lifetime, it may be the roles are reversed. You are the one who is more deluded. The other one is less deluded, right? Because these things change all the time. So there's no reason for conceit just because right now you may see the delusion of another person. Then you are on the right track. Yeah? And, uh, and these ways of talking about overcoming ill will are taken directly from the suttas. Uh, uh, and this particular sutta I'm talking about now is a sutta which you may want to look up. Uh, it is called the Agatha Pativinya Sutta, the overcoming of uh, ill will or resentment. Uh, it is found in the numerical discourses of the Buddha, chapter 5, the num five number 162. is a beautiful sutta on how to deal with ill will and how to establish metta and compassion in its place. Uh, and this is exactly the kind of advice that is given there. On the one hand, you see the good qualities in others, you throw the bad qualities out because you know they are rubbish, and you carry the good qualities of a person in your heart. And then when you see some little thing that irritates you, you take out those good qualities to overcome that negative perception you may have. And the other one, if you cannot see any good qualities in someone, that is the time to use compassion. So use that wisdom. Yeah, and you can overcome ill will. Remember, ill will is the big one. If you deal with anything in your life, deal with ill will completely until you don't feel any ill will whatsoever in the world. And you always have metta and compassion for every single being. It's a high ask, but it can be done. Remember the simile of the soul. Okay. So let us move on. I'm going a little bit faster today because a lot could be said about this. Because, uh, uh, but uh, every retreat has to be a little bit different. Then. So uh, now, uh, whatever a mendicant uh, or a lay person, anyone really frequently thinks about or considers, uh, becomes their heart's inclination. Uh, if they often think about and consider 
as sensory thoughts, and they have given up the thoughts of renunciation to cultivate sensory thoughts. Uh, the mind inclines to sensory uh, thoughts. Uh, if they often think about and consider thoughts of ill will, uh, yeah, or thoughts of uh, cruelty, yeah, the mind inclines towards ill will thoughts or thoughts of uh, uh, ruthlessness. Uh, if they often think about and consider thoughts of ruthlessness, the mind inclines to these kind of thoughts. Uh, yeah, so there is an inclination of the mind, and this is why it is so hard to overcome these things. Uh, because you have an inclination which is a habit from the past that has been built up throughout lifetimes, uh, these kind of thinking patterns are going to be very strong. Uh, that is why it is so hard to overcome, because they are habits. Uh, and this is why you have to re-reflect, recondition your mind again and again and again. Uh, and as you do that, the inclination gradually starts to change. Uh, your super tanker is moving in a new direction, gradually, 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 uh, yeah, until one day uh, it is completely turned around. Uh, suppose it's the last month of the rainy season, uh, when the crops grow closely together, and a cow herd must take care of the cattle there. Uh, he would tap and poke them with his staff on this side and that uh, to keep them in check. Uh, why is that? Uh, for he sees that if he wanders into the crops, uh, he would be ex could be executed, imprisoned, fined, or condemned. So here your mind is uh, uh, said to be like a cow. I don't know if you feel that is a apt comparison, yeah, but you have this cow inside of you, <laughs> and you have to tap it on that side, tap it on that side to make sure it doesn't stray into the crops. And of course the crops here are all the delightful sensual pleasures of the world, that's the crops here obviously. Yeah. And uh, so you, th this is then what we've been doing here with wisdom power, yeah? tapping the mind, this side and that, uh, to make sure it kind of stays out of those crops. Uh, because what happens if you go into the crops? Uh, it's pretty rough what happens when you go into the crops. In those days, they didn't mess around with punishment. They really got down to punishing you properly. Uh, mm -hmm. So if your cows go into the crops, you might get executed. Yeah, That's pretty... <laughs> Whoa, okay. <laughs> So in prison, maybe fine, okay, fine, maybe we can deal, can, can sort of agree with that. Condemned, okay, sh certainly condemned, maybe a little bit, uh, but even then mildly. Yeah. So, um, th so that's kind of the problem of sensual pleasures put in very stark words, right? Uh, they really kind of drive you on in the sensory realm, they drive you on in samsara. And because they drive you on in samsara, what they do, what they ensure, that you will get old and die in the future, many, many, many times over. It's like being executed, right? Uh, this is one of the things here. Yeah. But there's a powerful simile somewhere, it just comes to mind now that I'm talking about this, a simile of the, uh, the cow that is going towards slaughter. Uh, yeah, cow is all, this is kind of a simile for the sensory realm, a simile for samsaric existence. Uh, we are like cows being driven to slaughter. Uh, this is kind of the, uh, the star, very stark simile in the suttas. Uh, and that cow, every step it takes, uh, it is one step closer to slaughter. Uh, that is the kind of the, the simile, yeah? Every step we take, uh, we're one step closer to death. Uh, Death is like being slaughtered. It's like nature slaughtering you rather than you being slaughtered by someone else. But the effect is the same. Death is still the same thing. And sometimes someone's slaughtering you, okay, that's fast and quick, but the death that you we have is often slow and painful. It's even worse sometimes. You know, sometimes people want to have youth and want to be euthanized. They don't really want to go through all the problem of dying because sometimes it can be extremely excruciating and difficult. Anyway, I, <laughs> let's, let's leave that aside for now. So the point here is that you try to use wisdom to ensure that your mind does not go into the crops. And the crops here, the main crops to avoid here is a crop of ill will, because that is very detrimental. In the same way, I saw that unskillful qualities are the drawbacks of sordidness and corruption, uh, and that skillful qualities have the benefit of a cleansing power of renunciation. Uh. Sordidness, uh, right? The, uh, the Pali word is okara. Okara means it makes something low, 
yeah, it brings you down. You have a lower kind of mind state. Uh, and uh, you can tell that difference very clearly when your mind is pure and bright. It feels there's something very uh, refined and nice about that kind of mind. You know it is a higher kind of mind. Uh, this is the kind of mind you really want to have because it just feels right. Uh, you don't really need to ask anyone. Whereas the mind that is very defiled, full of all these kind of things, it has a sense of, it, it just doesn't feel nice. It is kind of sordid, as it says here. There's something kind of uh, low about it. There's a high mind and a low mind. Uh, and it's quite useful to reflect on that difference and see that. Uh, and of course, that will also help you to incline in the right way. Uh, yeah, the skillful qualities have a cleansing power uh, and the benefit of renunciation, giving these things up. Uh. So, that is the uh, bad qualities and how to deal with them. And now we come to the good qualities, uh, the opposite side of the coin, the good thoughts. Uh. Then, as I lived uh, in this way, uh, heedful, keen and diligent, uh, a thought of renunciation arose. Uh. Yeah, this is like the thought when you are happily enjoying the breath and you don't care about anything in the world and you're just happy and blissful. It's like a thought of renunciation. Uh, or when you kind of are... Uh, you're full. You're working too hard, and you kind of your your craving to meditate enters your mind because oh, this is just too much. Uh, and sometimes that can happen. Yeah, you remember the peace on the retreat you went to in uh, uh, the Nightingale Center. You think, oh, wow, that was so nice. Uh, now I have to do all this hard work. Yeah, it's beautiful when you think like that, right? And that's really, really nice because it means your mind is inclining towards the higher things in life. Uh, and then you think. Yeah, First of all, I understood uh, this thought of renunciation has arisen in me. Uh, it doesn't lead to hurting myself, hurting others, or hurting both. Uh, it nourishes wisdom. Uh, it's on the side of freedom from anguish. Uh, and it leads to nibbana, to extinguishment. Uh, if I were to keep on thinking and considering this all night, all day, all night and day, uh, I see no danger that would come from that. Uh, Still, thinking and considering for too long would tire my body. And when the body is tired, the mind is stressed. And when the mind is stressed, it is far from stillness. So I still settled and unified and immersed my mind internally. Why is that? So that my mind would not be stressed. So here you have the positive side of these thoughts. Yeah, the... Uh, thought of uh, letting go a little bit of that sensory world uh, because you realize the downside uh, and that very thought of letting go of that uh, and the movement of the mind in the opposite direction towards all these beautiful qualities uh, yeah there is no danger in that uh, you are heading in the right direction uh. but there's still a problem uh, and that is too much movement of the mind uh, too much uh, agitation too much thinking in general actually tires the mind out uh. So here it says it would tire the body. The word body here is not really quite right. The word kaya in Pali means much more than that. It means almost like the personality. I think I mentioned that before. It's like you become tired. You, you, your mental faculty also becomes tired. And when your mental faculty becomes tired, your consciousness, your entire, your entire mind becomes tired as a consequence. It becomes stressed, it says here. So too much thinking and too much pondering is, uh, is bad in its own right. And then, because you know that, uh, you then decide to meditate. You decide to enter samadhi, where the mind becomes completely stilled. Uh, no more thinking, one-pointedness of the mind. You're just enjoying the full stillness of the mind. That's where your energy comes back. Yeah? That's when you recharge your batteries fully. Uh, the other kind of recharging is only partial uh, and... and uh, sometimes not recharging at all. Here you are really recharging it. This is why meditation is so important for insight. Uh, this is why meditation is so important to be happy, right? Uh, all of these kind of things. Uh, because uh, you need that uh, energy of the mind, you need that power of the mind to be able to penetrate and see reality as it actually is. Uh, this is where the energy comes from. Uh, and many those of you who had some nice meditation experience on this retreat will know what it means to have an energetic mind. It is very delightful and a very pleasant state to have. It's the opposite of the kind of the dull mind, the tired mind, the lethargic mind, right? This is the bright, it kind of clears up and it's kind of very beautiful. And this is what we're trying to achieve here. 
This is why samadhi is such a powerful tool in the quest for insight or in this beautiful uh, seeking for insight in, the, in this world. Uh, so this is how this works then. Uh. Now one important point here uh, that uh, is not maybe immediately obvious uh, is that there is a very clear hierarchy here to what we have to do. Uh. First of all, you overcome the unwholesome thoughts. Then you overcome the wholesome thoughts. Then you enter samadhi. Uh. And that sequence is very important. And it is a sequence that is very often overlooked in meditation circles. Uh. Sometimes it is people are told to sit down and watch the breath. Uh. But if their mind is full of defilements, uh, if they haven't practiced sila or morality already for a long time, uh, how is it going to be possible to watch the breath? Uh? Actually, it's impossible. It's going to drive you crazy. You're going to go psychotic. This is how people actually sometimes go psychotic on these retreats. They get these kind of instructions. Uh, Yes, you sit down and you are forcing yourself to kind of deal with something you cannot deal with and you can't move and all these kind of things. It, make, it can make life very troublesome. Huh? So that you are really reliant in those situations on some good advice on what to do. Huh? And an important part of that advice is you do things gradually. Huh? First of all, overcome the really coarse defilements of the mind huh? that is done by keeping the five precepts huh? yeah? and maybe keeping a bit more than that. Huh? Then the second stage is to deal with the ill will and those very coarse mental defilements, the very strong desires and those kind of things. You count that a little bit. Then you deal with even more refined defilements. Then you deal with the thoughts that are positive, that actually not defilements at all, and you overcome those. Yeah? And then, finally, you enter Samadhi. Please get the sequence right. Know what your main problems are. Deal with those problems first then you're going to be on the right track. Yeah? This really matters, because otherwise you're not going to make any headway. Yeah? If you try to jump straight to samadhi when you haven't done the basic work, it's not going to work. Yeah? And this is one re- maybe a reason why sometimes people, they meditate and meditate, they don't get anywhere, yeah? because they haven't really done the groundwork yet. Yeah? And that is often the, uh, the issue at stake in these kind of situations. So, so you still the mind. Um, so that the mind is not stressed, yeah? it is ready for even deeper things. Uh. Then, as I meditated, uh, uh, heedful, keen and diligent, uh, a thought of goodwill arose, a thought of compassion, harmlessness, but compassion arose. Uh. I understood that this thought of compassion has arisen in me, this thought of goodwill. Uh. Uh, it doesn't lead to hurting myself, hurting others or hurting both. It nourishes wisdom. It brings wisdom out. When you have goodwill and compassion, you become more wise. It's kind of interesting. Yeah? It is on the side of freedom from anguish, and it leads to extinguishment. Uh, if I were to keep on thinking and considering uh, this thought of goodwill, this thought of compassion, all night, all day, all night and day, I see no danger that would come from that. Uh, still, thinking and considering for too long would tire my, uh, my personality. Uh, And when the personality is tired, the mind is stressed. And when the mind is stressed, it is far from stillness. So I still settled, unified, and immersed my mind internally. Why is that? So that my mind would not be stressed. So the same thing again, but with the even more important defilements of ill will and harmfulness. And this phrase here, the stilled, settled, unified, and immersed my mind internally, this is a phrase that is used throughout the suttas to refer to the jhana states. So this actually means deep samadhi, yeah, the full samadhi, the real deal. Not, not any partial results, but the full stilling. Yeah. And then comes the same thing we saw before, the idea of, uh, uh, of inclining the mind, or whatever a mendicant Uh, frequently thinks about and considers uh, becomes the heart's inclination. Uh, If they often think about and consider thoughts of renunciation, they've given up sensory thoughts uh, uh, to cultivate the thought of renunciation. They might incline to thoughts of renunciation. If they often think about and consider thoughts of goodwill uh, uh, and also compassion, they might incline to thoughts of goodwill. uh, if they often think about and consider thoughts of compassion, they might incline towards thoughts of compassion. Yeah, and this is kind of the promise again of the Buddha, which is so, so nice. Yeah, there is hard work to be done. 
There is a work of re-establishing your perception, perceiving people in a new way, looking at the world in a new way, and that takes work. It takes uh, the using of your mind in a heedful and careful way, circumspect way about how you live your life. Uh, but if you do this consistently, uh, if you turn your mind towards compassion and goodwill consistently, again and again, challenging those harmful defilements of the mind, uh, if you feel angry, challenge that anger. Don't just go with it. Uh, be someone who is, uh, you know, who challenges the world. Uh, if you're going to be someone, you're already, many of you are Buddhist, you're already challenging the establishment already by kind of leaning in this way, right? But challenge what really matters, which is some of your internal defilements. Challenge those. Ask yourself, how real are they? Is this just a silly habit of mine? And you can guarantee, I can guarantee you that it's just a silly habit. It can be overcome. And then one day, as you overcome this, you will be going in the exact opposite direction. And you can't stop yourself from having compassion and goodwill anymore. Eh? Whereas before, you couldn't stop yourself from being a little bit harsh, and having a little bit too much ill will. Eh? Now, you cannot stop yourself, even when it comes to people in the world that seem so terrible, right? The, kind of the great tyrants of the world, the great dictators, and the people who kind of are responsible for so many lives being killed. Eh? You start to have compassion for them as well. Eh? You start to have compassion even for the people who are really close in your life. Eh? Sometimes the people to have, are most difficult to have compassion and love and kindness for can be the people who are closest to you, huh? because they can be really irritating. Yeah? <laughs> because you know them too well, right? And they know how to press your buttons, right? And wow, that's really... If you can have compassion and kindness for the people who are closest to you, wow, you are really doing extremely well on this path. Yeah? That is where the really hard, hard work is to be done sometimes. Yeah? Yeah, but you can, and that is the thing, yeah. And if you really put your mind to it, I guarantee you that you can do that. Uh, and that is, uh, becomes very beautiful, and becomes very powerful, yeah. A family life where everyone, or you have compassion and kindness of everyone, it becomes a very wonderful kind of family life, or, uh, you know, however many people it is that you live with. Uh. So, uh, uh, the benefits here are very broad. Uh, the benefits are not just for the spiritual path, uh, but the benefit your entire life when you get these things right. Uh. So, yeah, suppose it's the last month of the summer when all the crops have been gathered within the village, uh, and a cowherd must take care of the cattle. Uh, while at the foot of a tree or in the open, he needs only be mindful that the cattle are there. In the same way, I need it only be mindful that those things were there. Yeah, things here are the states, the Dhamma, the uh, qualities of the mind. You don't need to poke the mind anymore because the mind is already heading in the right direction. You can just chill at the root of a tree. <sighs> I can breathe now, I can relax. Finally, I can relax a little bit. I don't have to do all this hard work all the time. I can really start to enjoy myself much more. And that, of course, is exactly what happens at this point. So, um, uh, then when all of this uh, is working in the right way, because you're overcoming your defilements, uh, then uh, this is what happens next. Uh, my energy was roused up and unflagging. Uh, my mindfulness was established and lucid. Uh, my body was tranquil and undisturbed. Uh, and my mind was stilled in samadhi. Uh, yeah, the energy comes up because the defilements are disappearing. When the defilements are gone, the mindfulness becomes really, really powerful. You're really in the present for once. Uh, the body is tranquil because the defilements are often what drives the kind of restlessness and the things in the body. And then this then leads to samadhi. Uh, so what you are seeing there is really very closely related to the awakening factors. Yeah? This sequence is just an alternative way of expressing the awakening factors. Uh, so when you overcome the hindrances of the mind, uh, the awakening factors awake in you. Uh, yeah? They start to come to the fore. Uh, and this is then what allows you to enter the jhana states uh, and then eventually also enter you to gain that deep with insight uh, that the Buddha had. Uh, so that's why the next one here is quite secluded from sensual pleasures, uh, secluded from unskillful qualities. Uh, I entered and remained in the first absorption, the first jhana. And then it take, goes all the way to the full awakening. I have left it out because I didn't really want to go through all of that at this point. Uh, just to keep the suspense a little bit. Uh. <laughs> but um, there is a nice, <coughs> uh, a 
nice simile that comes here at the very end. I'll read through it uh, fairly quickly because I think the meaning is quite obvious. Uh, and actually it is explained by the Buddha anyway. So I'm just going to read it out just because it is a nice simile. Suppose that a forested wilderness, uh, in a forested wilderness, there was an expanse of low-lying uh, marshes, uh, and a large herd of deer lived nearby. Then along comes a person who wants to harm, injure, and threaten them. Uh, they close off the safe, secure path that leads to happiness and open up the wrong path. Uh, there they plant a domesticated male and female deer as decoys, uh, so that in due course that herd of deer would fall to ruin and disaster her. Then along comes a person who wants to help keep the deer, the herd of deer safe. They open up the safe, secure path that leads to happiness and close off the wrong path. They get rid of the decoys so that in due course the, the herd of deer would grow, increase and mature. I've made up this simile to make a point, and this is what it means. An expanse of low-lying marshes is a term for sensual pleasures, the five-sense world. Right? And that is very evocative in a way. A marsh is a place where you tend to get stuck. Yeah? It is where you get bogged, you can you sink into your waist, and, or at least to your ankles or knees or whatever, and it's really hard to move forward. Yeah, and if this, this marsh is really vast and you're trying to kind of cross it or get out of it, you have a long way to walk and every step is just so heavy yeah, and it's really hard to get out. It's like syrup uh, and you are stuck in treacle. Wow, oh, you can barely get out of this. Uh. <laughs> and this is the idea of the five sense realm. It is like that, right? Uh, it is kind of very hard to extract ourselves from this. It feels nice, it feels good. Uh, we cannot really see what is going on. We are stuck in it. Uh, and this is what makes it so uh, difficult. Uh, and the five sense realm, once we clear out of that one a little bit, once we start to get into samadhi, we have done the hardest part of the Buddhist path. Uh, this is really the hard part, uh, because it is actually, uh, it is very tricky. Uh, and there's many kind of nice similes for the five sense realm in the suttas. The marsh, I think, is one of the, uh, one of the best ones. Uh, Another one is, of course, is this the stream, the current of the world. You are trapped by the stream and you're kind of moving along with the current of the world. Uh, and we have to go against that current uh, to be able to uh, emerge into something more powerful. Uh. So this is, in many ways, the most difficult part of the path. Once you come to, you withdraw out of that, uh, you come to samadhi, you come to the stillness of the mind. Uh, the only thing that really remains is seeing through the sense of self. Uh, and that is more kind of fun, yeah, because at this point uh, it may not seem like fun perhaps, but, but it is more fun because you are enjoying the stillness of the mind, you're enjoying the samadhi, yeah, and then you get the insight, seeing the nature of reality on top of that. Uh, it's actually kind of, that's where the really attractive part of the path begins. Uh, but uh, the hard yakka, yakka is an Australian word which means hard work, yeah? the hard yakka is kind of at the beginning, yeah. So, uh, okay. Uh, the large herd of a deer is a term for sentient beings. A person who wants to harm, injure, and threaten them is a term for Mara, the wicked. The wrong path is a term for the wrong aidful path. That is wrong view, wrong thought, wrong speech, wrong action, wrong livelihood, wrong effort, wrong mindfulness, and wrong stillness. A domesticated male deer is a term for greed and relishing. A domesticated female deer is a term for ignorance. Uh, yeah, these are the two things that block us in life, is craving and ignorance. Yeah? These two really problematic things. Uh, so craving is what ties you to the wheel of samsara going around. Uh, ignorance is what darkens your mind so you cannot see the way out. Uh, so you're tied by craving, uh, hindered by ignorance. Uh, kind of very pow powerful... Uh, little phrase that you find throughout the suttas. Uh, yeah, bound, by, bound by craving, yeah, hindered by ignorance. Uh. And these are the two decoys here. Yeah? They, they decoy you in, uh, onto this kind of uh, roaming about in samsara. A uh. person who wants to help keep, keep the herd of deer safe uh, is a term for the realized one, the perfected one, the fully awakened Buddha. Uh. The safe and secure path that leads to happiness is a term for the noble, aidful path. Uh, that is right view all the way to right stillness. Uh, 
So mendicants, I have opened up the safe and secure path to happiness and closed off the wrong path. And I have got rid of the male and female decoys. Out of compassion, I have done what a teacher should do who wants what is best for the disciples. Here are the fruits of the trees. Here are the empty huts. Practice absorption, mendicants. Don't be negligent. Don't regret it later. This is my instruction to you. Practice absorption. This is often translated as practice meditation. But the correct translation is practice absorption. So I hail Bhakti Sujato for getting this right. Well done now. This is what the Buddha said. Satisfied, the mendicants were happy with what the Buddha had said. So there you are. I will leave it at that. This could have been talked about in much more detail. But if you have any questions about that, we can take those this evening. And uh, so for now, please carry on enjoying yourself. Uh, there will be some more interviews at a quarter past ten uh, and lunch as usual. Uh, and we'll carry on with some more guided meditation at two o'clock this afternoon. I'll do that, actually. Sorry? 2.30. Two thir- two thirty. Yeah, I keep getting this wrong. Even up, you can do that one. Yes. Okay, okay, excellent. Uh, so that's great. Uh, so uh, there you are. So, okay, good. <laughs>